Lynn Petty, and uh, I was born in Smyrna, Georgia, in Cobb County. Uh, the youngest of three brothers. Uh, so that was hard on my folks right off the bat. <laughs> but uh, I had a good childhood. They were there for us. You know, we played sports. They took us where we wanted to go. For a lot of years, I didn't have any idea, you know, what some of the other things going on in the house were until I uh, got, got old enough to realize that uh, that stuff that was in the back of the refrigerator um, that only Dad drank, you know, that was his. And <laughs> things in the house were, were difficult at times. Dad, you know, I grew up in an alcoholic, alcoholic's house. Uh, he loved us. I knew. I knew he loved us. Uh, he would just be mean when he was drunk, you know. The the greatest times I can remember as a kid was getting to come up here to the lake, and it was such a big thing, you know. We came up here, and Dad, things. This was kind of where I was realizing what those things were in the back of the refrigerator. There we talked about. He'd had several of those that day, and my brothers were up there, and there were a lot of older kids there, and. Whatever reason, I went with the adults in the boat to, and my dad wanted to ski. So here I am at an eight-year-old boy, and I saw my dad skiing behind the boat, and it was, it was really awesome. I mean, I was so proud of him. Look at my dad, you know, look what he can do. He was just having the biggest time. He got, he got in the boat, he, just, he was so tired, he fell in the bottom of the boat and laughed, and he was just, you know, I thought everything was fine. I thought we were having a great time. Only until we got back to the dock, you know, so as we pull up to the dock, I, I can't wait to tell my brothers what my dad had done, how proud, you know, just how excited I was. And just as we were pe easing up to the dock, I heard some of the older kids say, look at your dad, he's wasted. Your dad's drunk. I don't remember much past that that day. I, I, I think I, I really shut down at that point as far as, uh, I can't tell you anything else about that day. But it was, it was, from elation to way down here. And it was tied into my dad and, 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 and that actually tied right into me. And so that was, that was a, I guess I, you could say that was a turning point. You know, that kid at eight years old was told he was different. So now I had to figure out whatever I can do, whatever it took for me to fit in. And I always felt like I had to fit in. And that wasn't, I couldn't just be me. Uh, by the time high school was over, you know, I had messed up my sports by getting a police chase, uh, DUI at 16, three days before my 17th birthday, you know. Should have been a real eye opener. Should have been a real eye opener for everybody around me. Maybe it was, but nobody, nobody came and said, hey, may have an alcohol, you know, drinking problem here. You might want to deal with this. None of that. It was, and I guess you could say it's just because that's what our family was used to kind of thing. Uh, my brothers had both gotten in trouble kind of like that. And we, they got their slaps on the wrist. They never, they never really got in the trouble I, I wound up in. But uh, little did they know I was already using drugs and everything else at that time. You know, I knew what, uh, I knew what eight ball of cocaine was in 12th grade, which is something a kid should never even, you know what I mean? Shouldn't even be close to that, but there I was. I turned 21, and I had already been in every bar in town, and you know, I fake ID or just trying to look like I was older and just go to the bars. And it was, it was two weeks later, and I got my second DUI, right after I turned 21. And so, yeah, then it was time. That was my first experience with uh, not an overnight type thing. That was my first experience with I had to I had to serve seven days of a 14-day sentence. You know. You would have thought that would have been a real eye-opener, a real way. But all it really did was make me be more careful as I drunk or drank and drove, you know? And it, was, it had become something that, uh, it was part of my personality at that point. That's kind of who I was. And we were still very young, and that just wasn't enough pain yet, you know? That didn't hurt enough. By then, at 23, had had been doing a lot of work out of town and had developed a crack addiction in Miami. And we were working down there right after that big storm blew through back in the 90s, and uh, uh, was working out of town all the time. And 
I'd already gotten so deep into hanging out with a lot of cocaine dealers at that point that, you know, I had been to the place where we had snorted more than we couldn't snort anymore, so we decided to start smoking it, you know, and that wasn't an option being out of town. Of course, you went to Miami, and back then, early 90s, cocaine was just everywhere, and so my, my addiction just snowballed after that. Really got into doing a lot of more cocaine. I, I became the guy that would drive the dealers around and, uh, you know, made my made my high and made my money that way. I would keep them, keep them in line while they did their thing. And, you know, when they'd pass out, I'd take over the business for a little while. You know, it was that, it was some weird times. Uh, a lot of drugs, a lot of drugs through my 20s. And um, only until I turned 30 did I become where I was just, a, I was just, I was a crackhead at 30 years old. That's all I did. I'd become a thief. You know, couldn't keep a job, and you wanted to get high. I had a little truck, and I could steal stuff. I could put it in the back of it. I could take it over there. I could sell it. I could get high. And that's what I did. And I found this one guy that he liked, uh, he liked street bikes. I knew motorcycles. Been known, you know, rode my whole life, and I knew where I could go. Whole another county over here where I knew some nice bikes. You know, I knew where to go find them, and I'd go get them. Take them down there to him. Uh... And that went on for about a year. And that was right, I was about, I was 29 at that point. And I had sold one to him, I'd gotten my money, I'd went to a hotel, I was laid up at the hotel. And I tried to buy some, some more drugs, keep going doing what I was doing. And the guy had brought me heroin and I didn't know it. And it looked like crack, I thought it was crack. This fella called from up here somewhere wanting a boat motor that I had come up with. <laughs> Lord forgive me. I was going to leave the hotel down in Fulton County and come up here to sell it to him. But I had used a little bit of that heroin on the way, and man, I got up here and I got so lost. And then I used a little more of that, and I didn't realize what was happening. I kept waking up. You know, I was get, I thought I was smoking crack. Crack doesn't do you that way. This thing was knocking me out, and I would come to, and it, it was so messed up, I, it wasn't dawning on me that it was what I was, it wasn't, this is, I thought I was just tired. Because I'd stay up at five days at a time. I thought I was just tired, but this stuff was knocking me out and I didn't know it. So I couldn't find the guy. I wound up going back down 400 and I wound up over in Roswell and I can remember getting off at the exit. I found me a little back road and I did a little more. And the next thing I know, I'm, I'm nowhere near there. So my vehicle was going down the road and a person was driving that thing that has no recollection of how he got from the highway 400 all the way over to by Lassiter High School. And I was a mess. I mean, I looked like a thief. I, I had the boat motor in the back of the truck. I had tie downs for motorcycles. I had a ramp to get it in the truck. I had stuff in the truck with me. And, and, and by that time, I had, I had learned that where I was running around, if I didn't have a gun, I was liable to get hurt. So I had bought a gun from the guy who bought the motorcycles from me. And I usually carried it stuck down in between the seat so you could see it, what it concealed. Well, when I woke up to on my window, I was sitting in a I was sitting in a, a gas station parking lot that was closed, and that was a police officer knocking on my window to wake me up. Truck was running, the air conditioning was on, in neutral with the parking brake on. I was asleep. And when I woke up, I realized I was like, "Oh man, you know, there he is." I don't think I can explain my way out of this. First thing I did was look, and my pistol had went down in between the seats. So I'm like, "I'm like, oh man," and I knew. And I was so tired. I was so tired. I was on a, I had been on a bender for a long time. And I, I you know, I just got up out of the car, opened the door. I didn't have a shirt. I had a pair of shorts and tennis shoes. I'm sure I had a little bit of hair back then. And I was, I was just a mess. And I got out of the car. And as soon as I got out of the car, he shined his light back in there. And my, my pipe and my, the little bit of drugs I had left was sitting there in the seat and the pipe just rolled across the seat and we both just watched it roll and I just looked at him and held my hands out to take me to jail. I was I was a mess. And then he said, well, you got any guns in there? I said, yep, it fell down between the seats over there. And that's why I just got out of the car, you know, and he's, he just put me in the back of the police car and I was such a mess. I just went back to sleep in his car. I mean, I was, I was, it was bad. He took me to, cha to jail then on a possession of cocaine, which of course he just figured that's what it was. Uh, concealed weapon 
And having the two of those together, depending on what county you're in, and like I say, Cobb County, that's the jail. That's why I always went to Fulton County, but Cobb County, they combined the two of those and made a whole nother felony. So I showed up at Cobb County Jail with three felonies. I got out of jail on bond or whatever, and I decided to get some help. I knew how bad it was. Um, and I went to a in-house uh, rehab for three weeks after that first time. And then I went to another facility that was a, a halfway house. They got me to a place. I had had enough that first time. And they got me to a place where I had turned my life over to God. And I had, uh, I had become a Christian and had began to live my life a different way for a solid year before I went to, to court on those charges. And uh, I'd made some bunch of changes, you know, and things were a lot better. Um, but it wasn't quite where I needed to be. And I wound up, if I had given up the women like I was supposed to and waited on Miss Wright, I fell in love with Miss Wrong and tried to help her out of her addiction. <laughs> and so I started smoking the pot around her and then, and then she and I broke up in a bad way. Uh, and, and man, I went right back across that bridge down to Fulton County and got, got messed up that night and spent all the money I had saved up and everything else and opened the door back up to my addiction and wound up quitting the job up here after three and a half years and it was just a matter of time at that point. I went all the way back in. I went back to it. I was right back in, and, and let me tell you, it was worse than ever getting back high because now I had a taste of what it was like to live sober, because for three and a half years, no alcohol, no drugs. And I had a taste of what that life could be like. So three and a half years later, I go back, and I'm still on probation. It was, I, I, Living life the way I was supposed to, when I went to court, God worked a miracle, and then and that worked out. But I still came out, I came out of there with seven years probation, and I'm three and a half years into it when I screw up again. And I just go right on off the deep end, upset everybody. You know, I had earned, I had, I had earned a lot of trust back, and, and a lot of things had, had gotten good for me. And then, bam, I'm right back in it, and, and I'm sitting in there just as, just as bad as ever. And uh, some guy had went and robbed someone's house. And I'm sitting down in, down there and just, I had loaned my truck out. And the guy was supposed to come back with it. When he came back with it, this guy showed up with this checkbook where he just stole the stuff out of these people's house. We didn't know he had just stole it. I mean, I mean, he had just left these people's house. <laughs> it was, anyway, the drug dealer said, hey, can you cash a check? Because I had done a little check cashing thing years ago for him back before. And uh, so I'll try. And the check was a blank checkbook. I mean, it was foolishness. Uh, let me say I had already prayed and asked God to help me because I couldn't stop myself before this day. I, had, I knew how bad it was. I knew I wanted out. And I had asked God to, to, to help me because I couldn't stop myself again. I had got to that place. I wasn't physically addicted, but mentally I could not stop living that way. I'd done that, I'd been there two times in my life, and this was the second time. So off we go to the liquor store to try to cash the check. Uh, they had given me a little something for going to do that, and I had tucked it into my hat. Went on in the store with that bad check, and stood there long enough for the man to call about the check. Well, when he called about the check, the police were in these people's house writing up a report for had just gotten burglarized. So it looked like I had just done it, and went across the bridge with the check and didn't, you know, it looked like I had done all that. Well, of course I hadn't, but they didn't know that. Um, the man hits the lock button on the door and I tell you, I was so wore out again. I was so, so run down again. I just, I couldn't move. I could have tried to get out of the place, but I, I just couldn't move. My feet felt like two big old giant cinder blocks. I couldn't pick them up. I was just, I just stood there. The law came up, arrested me. It got me uh, that time, two counts of forgery. I'm standing there with, uh, that's two more felonies. And uh, I forgot about that little piece of drugs I had in my hat. 
And when I got to jail, of course, they took my hat from me. And that thing fell out, and they found it. And so I got another possession charge. So now I'm looking at three more felonies. That's a total of six. And, and, and I'm on probation for the first three still. So of course, they revoked my probation. I don't get out after that. I stay in there. I did, I did, uh, I did like six or seven months at the county jail waiting on them to revoke my probation. They finally revoked it. Once they did that, they sent me to a probation detention center. I gotta say this, when I wound up back in that cell, that same dorm with all those guys, same spot, same spot I was in. I mean, literally to the place on the floor with my mat, I was in the same place I was three and a half years before. And I, I asked God right there, that day, that's where I said, Lord, I don't know what it's gonna take. I said, but I can't live like this anymore. I can't ever do this again, and I, and I don't want to. I wanna have some shot at life, and I don't wanna hurt anymore. I don't wanna hurt anybody anymore. I'm tired of this. I knew how much trouble I was in. Figured I was gonna do some time. I didn't know, but I, at that point, gave it all to him, right there on that concrete floor. I didn't have much else to give, you know what I mean? I was one step away from, all I could have been was under that slab, dead. I mean, I had been to the other things that they say you wind up as a drug addict. And I didn't want to die in that mess. I had, I had too much love in my heart. I had too many people love me and cared about me, and I knew I could do better. You know, I had a taste of it. I, I, I began to walk as a Christian while I was in there. And, and of course, you know, nobody wants to really believe you at that point. They want to tell you it's just jailhouse, but that's just, uh, for me, I was done. And I was going to live right, even, five, even, even the fact that I was in there didn't have, to, didn't have to matter. I was going to live right in there, and I was going to, I'd begun my new life, even though I was still locked up and didn't know how long I was going to be locked up. And when I, got, when I got back from court, from Cobb County, I had a five do three. And of course, then I had to go answer for the charges in, in Fulton County, but they ran everything concurrent, which was, which was a blessing too. So now I'm sitting there in the probation detention center. I'm waiting to go away. They came to get me. They, they sent me into the state, the state system, took me to Hayes Boot Camp. Got there in November. I don't know if you know where Hayes is. It's in Tryon, Georgia. That is right below Tennessee. It's the mountains in November. Did get the boot camp. The boot camp is eight tents set up out in a gravel parking lot with a big fence around it in the mountains, Georgia. Hi, it was cold, man. It was cold and it got real cold by the time I got out of there. Uh, I, I did I did three months and did the boot camp. And uh, during all that, from the, the 10 months over here and the, and the four months at the boot camp, you know, I wound up serving, I was, it was over 14 months, but that's, that's what I wound up doing was 14. Of course, when I got out of jail and all that was said and done, I knew I, I knew I needed uh, more help. I wasn't ready just to jump right back out there. So I went back to that halfway house that I had known because I knew they were good people. I wound up staying there well beyond the length of time I, I didn't have to leave. Became a counselor there while I was attending Bible college. You know, I got out in March of 2001 and uh, by 2005, did I do it perfect? No, not a perfect human being. No, none of us are. There was only one of those. But made it to 2005. Uh, finished Bible college. Was an ordained minister by then, and had uh, had gotten married in 05. Uh, got a child now. We had a baby girl in 07. Um, in 2008. Probably at that time in 07, 06, 07, 08, I had to, I had, uh, I had, God had just thrown doors off the hinges for me to get jobs. It was amazing how I had asked him, you know, to lead my life, and then I, I led him, and, and I began to do things that I was supposed to do. Answered the call that was on my life. That's something I didn't realize it was there all those years. I think that's why my, 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 my story is what it is. It's because it was so bad because I, I had a call in my life, and, and, and I finally answered that, and, 
and then things just changed and they began to get just better and better but in 2008 i had a deal where I went and started my own company we've been in business since 2008 when i got laid off and um we've been blessed am i super wealthy and all that no but we have been able to pay our bills and, and and do the things we need to do and have a little extra and and that's that's what where I'm at today and uh, you know still I'm a, like I say I'm an ordained minister now so I I, I reach back I go and do some uh, outreach and I also minister at that halfway house still one, at least once a month right now I've been doing that for like ten years now uh, it's just uh, if anybody is at their very lowest and can just open their heart enough to believe that they can do more and they can do better. And if they've hurt just enough that they don't want to hurt anymore, they can make the change. It's always hope. Always hope. That's my story. If you're at your lowest point right now, I know what that feels like. I've been there. I don't know what your low point is. I know mine was deep in drug addiction and every other thing that comes with that. I would say this, if you really want help and get on your knees, and there is a God above, get on your knees and pray, things will begin to change. There is help out there even if you can't make that choice just yet, you can, however, find a phone book. Ask someone to Google it for you on their phone, okay? There's help out there. There are halfway houses. There are in-house facilities. Ask a policeman. Believe it or not, they want to help someone. If you really want help out of your addiction, the help is out there. If you're already incarcerated, know what that feels like been there then I would say make the change now begin to be who you're gonna be now don't live in there on everybody else's terms and then try to change when you get out don't listen to what anyone says in there there are ministries I know there's chaplains and everything else that come to each facility they're there find them get the help you need and I would say to you this, it's not easy. But if you want it and you've hurt bad enough and that doesn't, you don't want to hurt anymore, you got to make a choice. And it's the right choice. <laughs>